Welcome to part two of the review of Practice Bulletin 180 for July 2017, Gestational Diabetes. We left off talking about non-pharmacologic therapy, specifically diet. Now, to finish that up, we should briefly discuss exercise. It is recommended that the patient engage in 30 minutes of aerobic exercise five days a week, or 150 minutes a week. The bulletin suggests 10 to 15 minutes of walking after each meal. Okay, let's talk about pharmacologic therapy. But first, let's talk about the thresholds that we're looking for. The ACOG and the American Diabetic Association recommend fasting values to be less than 95, one hour values less than 140, and two hour values less than 120. We generally recommend two hour postprandials. Insulin has long been the mainstay of treatment for patients who consistently exceed the previously noted thresholds. While the postprandials are heavily influenced by the diet, the fasting blood sugars are more affected by insulin resistance alone. For this reason, letting a patient try working on a diet a little longer to control fasting blood sugars is unlikely to be effective and pharmacologic therapy is indicated. The bulletin doesn't get into a lot of specifics on how to give insulin, but gives a few guidelines, like starting with a total daily insulin dose of 0.7 to 1.0 units per kilogram. That should be divided into short-acting and intermediate-acting insulins. The bulletin was clear about using the short-acting insulins, like Lispro and Aspart, to cover meals as opposed to regular. They have an onset of 1 to 15 minutes as opposed to 30 to 60 minutes. This more closely mirrors the absorption of food and allows the injection with a meal as opposed to before it and has less hypoglycemia from the peak effect of regular insulin being 2 to 4 hours. Residents are often looking for a formula to make initiation of insulin easier. But the way it often works in practice is someone ends up multiplying 65 kilograms times 0.7 units per kilogram, coming up with 45 units, and then feeling like that is too much. So they arbitrarily pick some lower number. The distribution of insulin depends on which values are abnormal rather than an arbitrary division. But in general, NPH covers the fastings and short acting taken at meals covers that postprandial. Most of the time after that, it's just frequent adjustments every couple of days. Many patients are hesitant to begin insulin injections, but will proceed with oral therapy. Despite not having FDA approval for this indication, oral therapy is being used more and more. Metformin crosses the placenta, and there haven't been adverse effects, but there isn't any long-term follow-up. For this reason, the ADA still considers insulin first line and metformin a good second line. It can be started as 500 milligrams and increased to twice daily with a maximum dose of 2,500 to 3,000 milligrams according to this bulletin. The main side effects of abdominal pain and diarrhea can be minimized by increasing slowly. Glyburide is a sulfonylurea that should be avoided in those with a sulfa allergy. Its main side effect is hypoglycemia, which can usually be avoided by starting low, like 1.25 milligrams daily, then increasing to 2.5, 5, 7.5, 10, 15, and finally 20 before being augmented with insulin. Two recent meta-analyses showed worse outcomes than insulin in terms of RDS, hypoglycemia, macrosomia, and birth injury. So, it's probably a third line option. Antenatal testing is recommended for poorly controlled gestational diabetics beginning at 32 weeks. Since the risk of stillbirth before 40 weeks is not increased in well-controlled gestational diabetics, it is not clear whether they need testing and can be done according to local practice. We tend to begin at 36 weeks. Delivery timing recommendations. The bulletin recommends that for A1 diabetes controlled by diet alone, 39 zero to 40 weeks, six days. For A2 diabetes, which is well controlled, 39 and zero to 39 six. 
for A2 poorly controlled 37 and 0 to 38 6, although there is no agreement about what is considered poorly controlled. Root of delivery. Although complications increase with increasing birth weight, the problem is complicated by frequent overestimates of weight, and 962 cesarean sections would have to be done to prevent one case of brachial plexus injury. The bulletin concludes that you should counsel about the risks and benefits of scheduled C-section if the estimated fetal weight is greater than 4,500 grams. All gestational diabetics should have a follow-up glucose tolerance test 4 to 12 weeks postpartum. If you ask a resident if they have seen the results of an abnormal 3-hour glucose tolerance test in pregnancy, they will say, of course, many times. But if you ask how many times they have seen the results of a 2-hour postpartum test, most will say, never, even though the number should be the same. That's because compliance is generally terrible. After a pregnancy, with that terrible diet and checking blood sugars, the idea of packing up their six-week-old baby, heading off to the lab for the whole morning to see if she gets to do that for the rest of her life is apparently undesirable. But according to the bulletin, 70% will have diabetes 22 to 28 years later, or another way of saying it is, all but 25% will have diabetes in 25 years. So encourage your patients to follow up. All right, here's the summary. Level A recommendations. In patients who fail diet and exercise, insulin is considered the first line. Level B. All patients without pre-existing diabetes should be screened. We use a one-hour 50-gram oral glucose tolerance test at 24 to 28 weeks. In patients who decline insulin or can administer it, metformin is a reasonable second line. Glyburide should not be recommended as first line. Patients should be counseled about the risks and benefits of scheduled C-section for an estimated fetal weight greater than 4,500 grams. Level C, or expert opinion, no cutoff for the one hour is clearly superior. 130, 135, and 140 are acceptable. Pick one for the practice or institution and be consistent. We use 135. Same goes for the three hour. Pick one and be consistent. We use Carpenter and Coustan, 95, 180, 155, 140. We use an elevated fasting or elevations of two of the others to make the diagnosis. Check blood sugars, fasting, and one or two hour postprandials. Three meals, two to three snacks. 150 minutes of exercise a week for delivery timing, diet controlled, 39 0 to 40 and 6, well controlled with meds, 39 0 to 39 6, poorly controlled, 37 0 to 38 6. Two hour 75 gram oral glucose tolerance test, 4 to 12 weeks postpartum, fasting blood sugar less than 100 and a two-hour less than 140 are considered normal. In those patients, assess the glycemic status every three years. Everybody else refer for follow-up because they've got prediabetes or diabetes.